afternoon. And thank you all for coming. But before I even start, I must thank uh, Sarah for thinking she should translate my poor little novel and uh, the publisher and the organizer of this conference. I wish I could really just talk to each one of you individually and privately and answer your question. Because I know whatever I say here will not answer everybody. But then that's not how conferences are run, hey? I want to start by saying I am deeply and sorrowfully aware of the role the international community played in the fight against apartheid. And Canada was, if not their leading country in that fight, one of those countries. Today, when we look at where South Africa is, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder to all of us that apartheid may officially be dead, but let me tell you something. Apartheid is alive and well. Legally, it was dismantled in 1994. We all know that. And that doesn't mean there was nothing about which to rejoice. There was. The dismantling of apartheid is something that none of us alive, none of us who lived through apartheid ever thought would happen during our lifetime. I worked at the anti-apartheid radio unit in the United Nations. I met a lot of South Africans who were exiles. Every two years I went back home on, 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 on home leave. Nobody knew where I was working at the UN at home. I didn't broadcast this, of course. I, and I'm not a very good liar. It, it would always have to be something to do with education. What do you do? Uh, UNICEF, what do you do? Uh, UNESCO, what do you do? I never, I couldn't admit I worked for the anti-apartheid radio uh, programs for obvious reasons. Uh, not even my family knew that. But um, the exiles themselves, nobody thought we would live to see the end of apartheid. The dream was in the future. It was not a dream that we thought we would live to see the end of apartheid. We were all taken by surprise. And when I say all, I mean the oppressed and the oppressor. But then it came to pass. I'm not a poet. I'm not even a writer, but I'm more a, <laughs> I'm more a writer than, you know, I'm more a writer than a poet. I used to write poetry, but I never thought I would publish poetry. But at the end of 93, beginning of 94, I felt so strongly about what was happening in my country that I wrote a poem called Fear of Change. That doesn't mean I didn't want change. Believe me, I was eager for that change. I was happy it was coming, but Having lived in the, in the United States, where supposedly people who looked like me had won the civil rights uh, movement, I knew what was coming to South Africa. And it, it, so I'm not cl claiming to be particularly insightful or brilliant, but having seen that sad example and looking when every, you know, 92 I was home and Joy was painted on all the faces of the people I met, black, white, and everybody else, about the coming change. And I looked at a young man in my street in Guguleto, where I made my home then. Joseph, all of 21 years, what could change in that life with three years of schooling? And that is what that is where the majority of people who look like me in South Africa was. 1994, when we got our Uhuru, 80% easily of black, black South Africans were semi-literate. 
unfortunately, the situation has not pro you know, improved with uh, democracy. In fact, great thinkers like Mampela Rampele have said publicly, publicly, that what the, 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 the African child is undergoing now, disguised as education, labeled as education, is worse than Bantu education. Remember 1976, the outburst, the, you know, was about Bantu education. It was not only about, you know, I mean, the, the symbol was the language that the government, the apartheid government, forced on black children to learn more than 50% of their subjects in Afrikaans. That was, you know, what, you know, the last straw on the camel's back. But the whole Bantu education thing was designed, and this was no secret, the apartheid government said in parliament, passing the Bantu Education Act, that African children, Bantu children, as the nomenclature went, shouldn't be led to think they can graze on the green pasture. They are being taught, they are being educated to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. And to ensure that that happened, as late as the mid 1980s, this is how much the government of the day was spending on the education of the children of the country. I'm saying of the country and not of the nation deliberately. Or, and the, the rent then was 14 times you know, stronger than the dollar. For one white child per annum, 28,000, okay? For a colored or Indian or Asiatic, as they said, child, of course it came down to, 20, to 48, 28,000. And when it came to a child who looked like me, the government spent all of $28 a year. Today, when the people who are governing mess up big time, I always say that's what you get for a $28 a year education. That does not excuse their being crooks. That does not excuse the, you know, the shenanigans they, they, they play. But in aptitude and not knowing what to do, that's part of the education that the past, that history, bestowed on the people who are now governing, most of them. Not the ones who were in exile, but definitely the ones who remained in South Africa. Fear of change. April 1994, with bated breath we wait. At last, we join the rest of progressive humanity. Uhuru, inkululeko, kiki, 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 kiki. Shall we sing and dance, our cup truly overflowing? Why then am I not overjoyed, frozen my heart? Shall I with you a secret share? My biggest fear. What makes me tremble, fearing the terrific morrow? I have seen the promised land, Harlem, U.S. of A. The world has a memory swifter than a blink. Give it a decade or two. If that, then fast and full will questions flow. Why are they not making it? What's holding them back now? After all, apartheid is gone. I have seen the thick, welted scars on people rudely plucked from hearth and home, bound, hand and bleeding foot, kicked, punched, raped, and ravaged every which way you care to think, killed in their millions and dumped on icy waves. And today, those unlucky enough to survive the gruesome plunder annoy the world by failing to be quite, quite human, by falling short of accepted standards of civilization. Never mind that on these people was performed a national lobotomy that has left them with no tongue of their own, no tongue to call their own. I 
I think South Africans, as well as the whole wild world, rejoice too soon. Apartheid was dismantled. What I felt needed to happen in South Africa, but who am I, a little person, you know, was a Marshall Plan. After those decades and decades, if not centuries of oppression, which, believe it or not, and I'm no apologies for white South Africans or anybody, but this is my truth. Apartheid maimed us all. You couldn't not be apartheid maimed. Whether your ghetto was a cushion of satin and lace and, you know, comfortable, or your ghetto was the dumps. You were, you were apartheid made. So white South Africans may think, and the world may think, white South Africans escaped apartheid. Yes, maybe, but nobody did because they did not live the kind of lives they would have lived where there no apartheid. Yes, their ghetto may have been comfortable, but they were, you know, manufactured and molded by apartheid. People's lives were changed. You had my compatriot here, okay, he's Canadian now maybe, Dan O'Meara. He said the same thing. He said people white who look like him in South Africa live, you know, grand lives that they could not afford elsewhere. South African blacks, when they go elsewhere, are surprised that people who are pale-skinned who are can do menial work. That, that doesn't belong there. That, 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 that is the work of black people. You know, you don't get white people cleaning windows, sweeping floors, and no. That in South Africa, that was called during apartheid, our way of life by those who enjoy privilege. What happened is that this got ingrained and separated us into different and disparate peoples. We are not, have not knitted into a nation 25 years after the death of apartheid. And I don't see us inching towards one another. I wish I could say we are inching towards another. I, white I remain white and segregated, and we remain mostly, by and large, I think 90% of black people still live in the same, you know, hovels they occupied before apartheid. Yes, Group Areas Act, the act that says, you know, whites live there, colors live there, Indians live there, and, and, and Africans or Bantu live over there. Those laws are gone. But who's going to give you the money to go and live there? If during apartheid, even if you manage to scrape through by some fluke and get an education, this is what I was. It wasn't a big education, but I felt it was huge. This is me with a grade 10 education and two years of teacher training, which only people who look like me could call themselves teachers without all, you know, of high school. Colored teachers and white teachers had to matriculate, finish high school. We could have grade 10 and two years of teacher training and call ourselves teachers. But even then, even if you had a degree, the, the salaries of teachers, of nurses, of doctors, of anything were arranged according to color. White male, white female, colored male, colored female, African male. There's Sindhuwe salary down there. You know what I mean? No, who's going to give Sindhuwe the money to go and live in? You know? Anyway, ap <laughs> apartheid died, but we are anchored in who we are. Now, the people who run the country want to appear like they are running the country. But if you read or watch the news, inside, you can see there's no running of country. It's crisis management. We go from one crisis to another. Okay, this happened. I'm going to do this to make it right. This happened. Where did they learn to run a country? And then I think of my years at the UN. 
and how when we sat together maybe over coffee as Africans, and if people were not busy trying to look better than they were, I have never in the 23 years I worked at the UN had any African from any country not say, my sister, I wish my country could be where it was at independence. Now, when you think what that means, a country should progress, a country could stagnate, which is what people are, are praying for. <laughs> 30 years after Uhuru, I wish my country could be where it was at independence. That's saying something about us throughout the continent. You would think with such warning, South Africa would wake up and do better. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We haven't. Different reasons, but the reasons may be different. The outcomes are the same. A betrayal of whatever you call it, revolution or something that the change and what people expect after the country their countries are free doesn't match it doesn't mean we are bad people but it does say and i hope and i pray i'm the age i am anywhere i go these days may i brag a bit anywhere i go these days i look around and i'm the oldest person in the room it's a bit of a shock, but it's also, it's also something I enjoy because it means God is still waiting for me to do something, you know. He takes the good ones. I'm not saying I'm the worst one. <laughs> but I'm saying I'm being given a chance to still do something. I pray in South Africa, in the continent, in the whole wide world, we may wake up to the one true fact that there is no other. There isn't in South Africa, there isn't in the world. We are so caught up in South Africa, I am so sad. We are addicted to hate, race hate. We are addicted to anger. If somebody, I mean, a driver comes, you know, does something, you can't be just a bitch, you are a black bitch or a white bitch. The, <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> As we say, the thing is, why is the color, the skin color of the person the most important thing in labeling them? If somebody that is nasty to you, why can't you just say, you are mean? Or, you know, why must the skin color play a role? But having said that, I'm old enough to also understand I was lucky, exceedingly lucky. I escaped my skin color. I discovered what it means to be truly human. And in South Africa, in my late 20s, I became truly South African. When my father was on his deathbed at a, you know, at a hospital in, 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 in Cape Town, in Hrutiskir Hospital, and I came with friends, about 13 of us, we walked in there on a Saturday afternoon, my father, I come from peasants, as you may have guessed. Neither of my parents had one education certificate. They didn't finish primary school. My father lying there, riddled with cancer, looks at the people I'm walking through, very comfortable looking as the friends we are, and he said, my, my daughter, you are blessed. I said, why? Look at your friends. They are everybody. He, he didn't have the, 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 the vocabulary to say they are all South Africans. They are the United Nations of South Africa. That's what he meant. He sees me there. I'm walking with white boys and white girls and colored and Indian. My father can't believe his eyes. But he knows that this is good. He knows instinctively. He knows that this is good. I was cured of looking at people because I got to know people. Yes. It was a big shock to me when I discovered through some experiences I had, huh, 
White people are just ordinary like me. They are people. They just... It's, 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 it's a disease I wish on everybody. If we could just get over ourselves. And in South Africa, this is what I say when I give talks. I say, if 25 years after the end of apartheid, you are still living a monochrome life, something is wrong with you. Please get out of your skin. Don't go to a church that only has people who look like you. Your children shouldn't be in a school that only has people who look like them. You know, get out, get about, mix around, find one another, because that's the only way we will get to know that this thing painted on our skin means nothing. Two, three years ago, I was asked by the uh, University of Stellenbosch. There's a, there's a big uh, uh, department there. Uh, it's called, uh, what is it called? Stellenbosch, uh, Steers. Yeah, yeah. It, there's another thing called Steers, S-T-E-E-R-S. Don't write that down. That's about where you go to go and eat all the junk food, all the meat you can eat. <laughs> Steers is S-T-I-A, -S, Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies. You don't apply to go there. You get invited. I'm still waiting. But, <laughs> <laughs> but somebody who's been a, a professor, an American uh, 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 woman who's uh, from... University of Pennsylvania, who's been going there. She is an, a paleologist, something like that. Y uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> Say it aloud so people can... Yeah, the people who go and look at old bones and things, something, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> from centuries ago, she's been doing... Her, 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 her name is Nina, Nina Jablonski, and her field is is, is uh, the human race, the evolution of the human race. There is one race, guys, and it is the human race. the human race. All the other things are myths and distortions and lies by scientists. She traces how scientists in 16 watt and 14 watt came up with, if your body is bit like this, if your nose is bit, you know, that means you're more intelligent. It's all lies. It's been disproved. But we cling on to these lies. And so the you know, Stellenbosch University wanted, she said, they said, Nina, uh, Dr. Professor Yablonski, what you do is marvelous. We need a children's book to cure the children of this country so that they grow up knowing that the color of their skin has nothing to do with uh, their ability or their character. And Nina uh, felt, she, 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 she's not South African, she's not a children's writer. I write everything, I write for children too. And she approached somebody else who looks like me and says, Njabulo Ndebele, to find her a children's book. Njabulo is five years younger than I am and 200 years ahead of me. So Njabulo called me, Sissy, I have this favor to ask. She wa he wants me to write a book with a scientist. Every bone in me says, you don't know how to write a book with a scientist, say no. But Jabulo is, you know. So I, I hear my, out of my mouth, okay, thank you for thinking of me. And I'm thinking, you are crazy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so we wrote a book called Skin We Are In. It's, 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 it's in three parts. There's me doing the yada yada, the story. And then there's Nina with the science part of how we came to be the way we are. And then there is another woman, an American, with diagrams. And what I learned from Nina, I always knew that this didn't matter. And I always knew it was not the most important part of who I am. We all know that, don't we? God Almighty, did I get a shock to know how much of anybody's DNA uh, 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 melanin uh, constitutes. Do you know? Yo, first of all, everybody has melanin. Guess why? It doesn't matter if you come from the north, north of north. It doesn't matter how pale-skinned you are, you have melanin. No melanin, no babies. <laughs> I didn't know this. I got it from the paleontologist. <laughs> Apparently, we need melanin, melanin to reproduce. And then South Africa, that made laws based on skin color. 
your DNA, in your DNA, melanin accounts for less than 1% of your DNA. You want to know how much less? One thousandth of a percent. Thank you. Amongst the various times that are incorporated in the story of Mother to Mother, Mère à Mère, a long passage happens when she refers back, when, when the mother remembers being displaced to the townships. We'll do the morning when the bulldozers come in uh, part. It's, it's in Chapter 5, and at the beginning of the chapter, you, they get the notifications that they're going to be displaced and there's complete disbelief in possibility that this many people could be displaced and where would they be going. So this is um, on the morning when it starts. Mandisa, Kaya, Mandisa, Vukani, Vukani, réveillez-vous, réveillez-vous. Profondément endormi, je sentis quelqu'un me secouer rudement par les épaules. Au feu, la maison brûle, je sautai hors du lit pour courir à la porte. Les incendies de Shax, ça arrivait souvent à Blowfly. Des mains me saisirent, des bras forts m'étreignirent contre la poitrine peu familière à l'odeur du tabac de mon père. Tata Tata me serrant dans ses bras Je savais que la situation était bien pire que si la maison brûlait. Quelque chose d'affreux s'était passé. Puis ça me vint. Soit j'étais morte, soit j'étais en train de mourir. Sinon, pourquoi mon père sévère et pas du tout démonstratif serait-il en train de me serrer dans ses bras Tata n'était pas du genre à s'amuser comme un chien qui s'ébat avec ses chiots. Mandisa, Tata said, shaking me by the shoulders. I was fully awake now and saw that Mama and Kaya were in the house. Their movements were not frantic. There was no fire. There couldn't possibly be. But then, what was the problem? My foggy brain asked. Why are pulling down our houses? Tata said the words gently with no hint of emotion whatsoever. I looked at Mama. We have to hurry and pack up everything, she said. Throw away anything for which you have no use. She herself was bent over a cardboard box already half full with dishes. It was long before sunrise on the first day of September. Tata, who left for work at half past four, had raised the alarm and Blowfly awoke to find itself under siege. Come and see, Tata said. Then taking Kaya and me by the hand, he led us out of the house. Outside, the air was hushed, a steady drizzle beating on the still black sand. In the gray half-light of a cloudy winter's dawn, foreign shapes loomed in the near distance, menacing. As soon as my eyes accustomed themselves to the poor light, they broke my windpipe, rob robbing me of breath. An army of invasion, a fleet of police, vans, bulldozers, and army trucks surrounded the location completely. In its entire vastness, Blowfly was surrounded and contained. As though enacting a long rehearsed macabre dance, out of each of the army and police vehicles and bulldozers sprang uniform-clad white men, hundreds of them, in a cloud of pink flesh faces peeping from beneath heavy helmets, beefy hands sprouting from camouflage uniform. The white men sat upon the tin shacks like unruly children destroying a colony of ant hills. Eyes peeled back wide in horror I watched, other lung men charged, teen walls were torn down with the inhabitants of the shack asleep inside some. Shacks came tumbling down, revealing primer stoves alight, pots of mealy meal porridge madly bubbling away in others. Some of the blowflies, some of blowflies most stubborn residents chained themselves to the doors of their homes, but the door frames were pulled down just the same pulled down with those poor, desperate souls chained right onto them. Grandpa Mkube, who lived up near the top of the hill, broke an arm in one such scuffle. To the day he died, more than a decade later, 
he never fully recovered the use of that arm. The pitiless, ruthless attack of the government people jolted Blofley into action. Our parents scurried to take more realistic, more aggressive action. Defeat looked them squarely in the eye, and they hurried to salvage what building material they could. Not new when first used to build our Blofley homes, and now rust riddled and rotting. Bits and pieces of their shacks, their homes. Their homes that even as they fended off the attack, the army and the police and the university students volunteering for public service were snapping off like toys. Dans la précipitation et la bousculade de cette journée, par miracle, Mama détermina Tata et quelques autres hommes pour aider Sis Loulou à déménager ses affaires. Si chaque famille prend une ou deux de ses affaires à la nuit tombée, elles seront presque toutes à Nyanga, les persuada-t-elle. Elle savait que si elle demandait même à Tata d'endosser seule l'entière responsabilité de déménager Loulou, il n'y consentirait jamais. Personne ne l'aurait fait. Rapidement, afin de devancer les démolisseurs empressés de sauver le peu qu'ils pouvaient de leurs chaxes, nos parents démantelaient les maisons eux-mêmes. Les yeux brillants de larmes refoulées, nos parents démantelaient leurs maisons, rassemblaient les clous rouillés dans des journaux, et enveloppait les paquets dans de vieux docks ou des tabliers, tassait le carton, le zinc, les poteaux et les planches, les sanglait en de longs faisceaux encombrants et les portait à l'épaule ou sur la tête. Tel les Imfenkane, fuyant Chaka, il y a plus d'un siècle, nos parents entreprirent leur trek, affligés et abattus, mais déterminés à rebâtir à nouveau, ils firent le long périple à travers les flats. De retreat à Nyanga, empruntant petites routes et chemins de traverse, sentiers, pistes à peine tracées, envahies d'herbes, ils longèrent d'interminables hectares de fermes qui domestiquaient les flats ensablés qu'aucun train ni autobus ne traversait. Ils longèrent Clip, Busy Corner et d'autres habitations à la périphérie de Heathfield, longeant les fermes qui approvisionnent Deep River, Stoyhoff, Plumstead, Wittebomer, Wimberg et les environs, ils avançaient, par centaines, ils trequaient, plus loin encore. C'étaient les fermes de moutons et de maïs à Ottery, puis les fermes de volailles de Lansdowne, qui traversaient d'un pas lourd. Une longue file d'humanité lasse, enfants, femmes et hommes, marchant à l'instinct, allant dans un lieu qu'ils n'avaient jamais vu, ils ne savaient pas ce qui les attendait. Ils traquaient, laissant derrière eux leur vie anéantie. Avec les véhicules du gouvernement pour les harceler, les baïonnettes dans le dos pour les pousser, les contenancer, souillés et épuisés, enfin leurs yeux découvrirent le désert, la terre stérile que le gouvernement leur avait réservée comme nouveau domicile. We got here. And everything and everybody changed, especially Mama. In Guguletu, the new houses changed us. People believed they had been bettered and strove hard to live up to that perception. In their wood and zinc and cardboard houses with wooden windows, they had needed no curtains or carpets or fancy store-bought furniture. In the brand new brick houses of the townships, With their glass windows, concrete floors, bare walls, and hungry rooms, new needs were born. But how to satisfy these needs? The wages of fathers had certainly not been augmented. Soon, all our mothers, who had been there every afternoon to welcome us when we returned from school, were no longer there. They were working in white women's homes, tired every day when they returned tired and angry. In time, we did not remember coming back from school to mothers waiting with smiles. Thank you.